When we talk about aliens, we talk about the search for extraterrestrial life. We kind of mean E.T., don't we? <laughs> we mean something that we can talk to. In the vastness of the cosmos, we can't be the only ones, right? There's just too much unknown about space for anyone to dismiss out of hand the chance of finding other intelligent life. Considering that life has developed and adapted to survive in some of Earth's harshest environments, just look at tardigrades, it's reasonable to assume that other interplanetary life forms have done the same. One of two things can be true. Either we are the only intelligent life in the universe, or we are not, as famous author Arthur C. Clarke memorably put it. Both are terrifying in their own ways. There's a good probability we have neighbors out there in the ether, since numerous findings and hypotheses from some of the finest minds in science point to the potential that there's something beyond us in the universe. Brian Cox says it's time to look at the evidence. The renowned physicist claims that there are indications of advanced alien civilizations in our skies. Is there any proof of his outlandish claim? Do aliens exist or not? Are they already among us? Let's find out. The first open meeting of NASA's new task force on unidentified anomalous phenomena, UAPs, took place recently. Any object in the sky that cannot be instantly associated with an aircraft or well-known natural occurrence is referred to as a UFO, or unidentified anomalous phenomena in official terms. Meanwhile, there have been pieces of evidence of extraterrestrial life in our sky. On October 19, 2017, Robert Warrick, a Canadian astronomer, was looking through pictures taken by the Pan-STARRS-1 telescope when he saw something peculiar. Warrick noticed a dot of light moving at over 200,000 miles per hour. Warrick informed his co-workers, who started monitoring the dot from several observatories. The more they observed, the more perplexing its actions appeared. It was a little object, about the size of a city block. It had to be very peculiarly shaped, since the brightness of the object fluctuated so drastically as it tipped through space. It was either flat and round, like a celestial pizza, or long and thin, like a cosmic cigar. It was speeding away more or less in a straight line as opposed to circling the sun on an oval path. Astronomers came to the conclusion that the bright dot was an entirely new phenomenon. It was an interstellar object, a transient visitor from a solar system far, far away. It became known as one I-2017-U1 in the International Astronomical Union's formal naming. It was given the more expressive name Umuamua, which is Hawaiian, and loosely translates to scout. Even interstellar objects are subject to the laws of gravity but Oumuamua seemed to be being propelled by an additional force as it sped forward. The gases that comets emit, which create their distinctive tails, give them an extra kick. However, Oumuamua lacked a tail. The telescopes pointed at it also found no signs of any of the byproducts of outgassing, such as water vapor or dust. This object is undoubtedly unusual. And regrettably, Oumuamua is already too dark and distant to allow for any additional observations. Astronomers carefully examined the data and eliminated one theory after another. The strange motion of Oumuamua could not be explained by a collision with another object, by interactions with the solar wind, or by the Yarkovsky effect, which is named for a Polish engineer who lived in the 18th century. One team of scientists came to the conclusion that the best explanation for one I-2017-U1 was that it was a miniature comet, with an undiscovered tail due to its unusual chemical composition. Another group asserted that the majority of Oumuamua was made of frozen hydrogen. The appeal of this theory, a variation of the mini-comet theory, was that it provided an explanation for the object's unusual shape. It had mostly melted away by the time it arrived in our solar system, just like an ice cube on the ground. Avi Loeb, a Harvard astrophysicist, provided the account of Oumuamua that was by far the most amazing. Loeb contended that Oumuamua didn't act like an interstellar object would because it wasn't one. It was created by a culture from another planet. Shmuel Bialy, 
A Harvard postdoc and Loeb suggested that the only way to economically explain Oumuamua's non-gravitational acceleration was to assume that the object was produced. It may be the alien equivalent of an abandoned car, floating in interstellar space as debris, or it could be a fully operational probe that had been sent to our solar system for reconnaissance. According to Loeb and Bialy, the second scenario was the more likely one because the odds of humanity ever finding the object were extremely tiny if it were just some alien trash drifting across the galaxy. Unsurprisingly, a lot of attention was paid to Loeb and Bialy's theory. However, several scientists disagree with Loeb, including astronomer Benjamin Weiner of the University of Arizona and astrophysicist Paul M. Sutter of The Ohio State University. Loeb increased his efforts instead of backing down. He attacked the frozen hydrogen idea with Theme Hoang, a scientist at the Korea Astronomy and Space Science Institute. The pair claimed that it was unrealistic to think that solid hydrogen would be floating around in space in another paper that was jam-packed with equations. And even if a frozen chunk did manage to form, a block the size of Oumuamua could not possibly survive an interstellar voyage. Considering the possibility that H2 particles could form, sublimation by collisional heating would, in a sense, vaporize them before they had a chance to take off. In Extraterrestrial, Loeb explains his thinking in the following manner. Without resorting to some form of undetectable outgassing, the only explanation for Oumuamua's peculiar acceleration is to postulate that the object was driven by solar radiation, or more specifically, photons bouncing off its surface and the object could only be pushed by solar radiation if it were very thin, no thicker than a millimeter, with low density, and had a sizably high surface area. Such a thing would act as a sail, but one propelled by light instead of wind. People make sails, not the natural world. Consequently, according to Loeb, Oumuamua must have been designed, built, and launched by an extraterrestrial intelligence. In 1995, Swiss astronomers Michel Mayer and Didier Quellos discovered the first planet to be discovered around a sun-like star. The planet was given the official name 51 Pegasi b, since its host star, 51 Pegasi, was in the constellation Pegasus. It was later given the name Domitium, thanks to a new naming scheme. The Oumuamua of its day, the finding of Domitium generated international news. The planet's mass, which is around 150 times that of Earth, proved to be extraordinarily huge. It had to be close to its star because it was whipping around it once every four days. It was also likely incredibly hot, with a surface temperature of up to 800 degrees. The discovery of such a huge body so near to its parent star shocked astronomers, who had to create a brand new classification for it and call it a hot Jupiter. The Kepler Space Telescope, which was created to find exoplanets using a different approach, was launched by NASA in 2009. A planet's passage in front of its star causes a very minor dimming of the star's brightness. Kepler detected variations in the brightness of more than 150,000 stars around the constellations Cygnus and Lyra. During the last transit of Venus in 2012, spectators on Earth could see a small black dot sneak over the Sun. It had discovered 1,000 exoplanets by the year 2015, by the time it ceased operations in 2018, 1,600 more had been exposed. The Milky Way has at least 4 billion sun-like stars, which implies that there are theoretically between 1.5 billion and 2.4 billion planets in our galaxy that may support life. Nobody is certain of what percentage of potentially habitable planets are really populated, but even if it's a negligible number, there are still millions possibly tens of millions of planets in the galaxy that may be teeming with life. Ellen Stofan, who was NASA's senior scientist at the time and is now the director of the National Air and Space Museum, declared at a public event a few years ago that she thought definitive evidence of life beyond Earth would be discovered within the next two decades. When, not if, life is discovered on other planets, what will it look like? That's the question the majority of scientists are now asking. Natural selection, according to Arik Kirschenbaum, is the foundation of comprehending cosmic zoology. He claims that this is the inevitable mechanism by which life arises, 
and that it is consequently not just restricted to the planet Earth, or even to organisms made of carbon. Regardless of how extraterrestrial biochemistry operates, natural selection will be at work. According to Kirschenbaum, it follows from this premise that life on other worlds will have evolved, if not along similar lines to life on our planet, then at least along generally recognizable lines. Feathers are a helpful trait, for instance on Earth where the atmosphere is primarily composed of nitrogen and oxygen. Feathers presumably wouldn't develop on a planet where the clouds are ammonia-based, but we should not be surprised to find the same functions, that is, flight, that we observe here. Likewise, according to Kirschenbaum, alien organisms are likely to evolve some kind of land-based locomotion. Life on alien planets is very likely to have legs, as well as an information exchange mechanism. Aliens in the dark will click like bats and dolphins, and aliens in the clear skies will flash their colors at each other. Even more unsettling than coming across sentient aliens is, possibly, the fact that we haven't heard from any of them yet. The Fermi Paradox is the name given to the puzzle of why this is the case. One day in 1950, while launching at Los Alamos National Laboratory, the physicist Enrico Fermi turned to some co-workers and asked, Where are they? At least, this is how one version of the story goes. According to another version, he asked, But where is everybody? This occurred years before Pan-STARRS-1 and the Kepler mission. Fermi believed that despite this, Earth was a fairly typical planet orbiting a fairly common star. He reasoned that there should be civilizations that are far older and more developed than our own, some of which should already be skilled in intergalactic travel. Strangely enough, nobody had arrived. Since then, a great deal of human intelligence has been spent pondering Fermi's query. Frank Drake, an astronomer, developed the eponymous Drake equation in the 1960s, which provides a technique to determine how many alien cultures there are that we can expect to speak with. The number of potentially habitable planets, the percentage of potentially habitable worlds that will develop advanced technology, and the persistence of technologically advanced civilizations are important variables in the equation. As the number of planets with a chance of supporting life has increased, the where are they mystery has only become darker. A French researcher named Jean-Pierre Rospard made the claim that aliens haven't contacted us because they're keeping Earth under a galactic quarantine, realizing that it would be culturally disruptive for us to learn about them, at a session on the topic conducted in Paris in 2019. Loeb suggests that Fermi could provide the solution to his own conundrum. Only in the last century or two has humanity developed the ability to communicate via radio waves with extraterrestrial beings. The atomic bomb was developed by Fermi and his Manhattan Project co-workers 75 years ago, while the hydrogen bomb was developed a few years later by Edward Teller, a lunch companion of Fermi's at Los Alamos. So not long after humanity developed the ability to communicate with other worlds, it also developed the ability to exterminate itself. We have continued to devise new means to destroy ourselves since the development of nuclear weapons, including unchecked climate change and synthetic microorganisms. The next few centuries of our civilization could very well be its last, warns Loeb, if we do not take precautions. He implies that alien civilizations, with the technological prowess to explore the universe, are also vulnerable to annihilation by self-inflicted wounds. Perhaps the reason no one has arrived is that no one is left to attempt the journey. This would imply that Oumuamua was the cosmic version of a potsherd, the creation of a long-since-gone society. This, albeit highly hypothetical, line of reasoning could be read as a warning to Earthlings to be cautious of new technologies. For his part, Loeb comes to the exact opposite conclusion. He believes that humanity should be attempting to create a photon-powered vessel that is exactly like Oumuamua. In order to achieve this, he serves as a consultant for the Breakthrough Starshot Initiative, whose stated goal is to demonstrate proof of concept for ultra-fast light-driven nanocrafts. In the long run, the group hopes to lay the foundations for a launch to Alpha Centauri the star system that is closest to Earth and is located approximately 25 trillion miles away. The astronomer Carl Sagan, who arguably contributed as much as any scientist has done to support the hunt for extraterrestrial life, 
popularized the saying that extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. Loeb's assertion plainly falls short of what is frequently called the Sagan Standard, and the strongest support he offers for his theory that Umuamua is an alien craft is that the competing ideas lack merit. We'd be fools not to investigate the possibility that Umuamua is an alien probe as long as there's a chance of it. However, Loeb explicitly rejects the Sagan standard, saying, It is not obvious to me why extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence, and turns its logic on its head. Extraordinary conservatism keeps us extraordinarily ignorant. In the meantime, a former intelligence official recently claimed in court that the U.S. government had long known about and covered up evidence of extraterrestrial life. At a House of Representatives hearing on UFOs, the witness, David Grush, said that the Pentagon had discovered biological remains thought to be of non-human origin and crashed vehicles. I was informed in the course of my official duties of a multi-decade UAP, Unidentified Anomalous Phenomena, crash retrieval and reverse engineering program to which I was denied access, he said at the hearing. My testimony is based on information I have been given by individuals with a long-standing track record of legitimacy and service to this country, many of whom also shared compelling evidence in the form of photography, official documentation, and classified oral testimony. Two other witnesses, both of whom were formerly in the Navy, gave testimony at the hearing about their first-hand encounters with UFOs while on the job, including one that was captured on camera in 2004. Any object that is detected that cannot quickly be explained is referred to as a UFO or UAP. While some turn out to be weather balloons, drones, or small aircraft for simple reasons, others are still a mystery. There has been a lot of buzz about the possibility of extraterrestrial life. According to a 2019 Gallup poll, 68% of Americans think that the government of the United States knows more about UFOs than it is willing to disclose. Meanwhile, 33% of American people surveyed thought that some UFO encounters had actually been alien spaceships visiting Earth. Congress convened two hearings on UFOs in the past two years, resuming its examination of the topic after an almost 60-year absence. The last such proceedings took place in 1966, when Gerald Ford, a congressman at the time, called two hearings to explore UFO sightings across the nation including in southern Michigan. However, no confirmed discovery of extraterrestrial life has been made. Grush claimed that he hasn't personally seen any UFOs, and he declined to publicly elaborate on some of his assertions due to security concerns, but he promised to be more open when they were alone. Grush was asked if anyone had been hurt or killed to hide information concerning extraterrestrial technology, and he replied in the affirmative. Grush also alleged that the military had misappropriated funds allocated for other programs to try to reverse engineer some of the purportedly non-human technology. However, when asked if anyone had been murdered, he said he had to be careful and had directed people with that knowledge to the appropriate authorities. After the contentious congressional hearing, Brian Cox commented on the possibility of alien life. The world's most well-known physicist, Cox, shared his thoughts on the subject on Twitter. In response to inquiries about his opinion of the UFO incident in Congress the day before, he wrote, I keep being asked what I make of the UFO thing in Congress yesterday, so here it is. I watched a few clips and saw some people who seemed to believe stuff saying extraordinary things without presenting extraordinary evidence. It would be excellent if true because it would relieve some burden on our civilization if we weren't the sole way for the universe to understand itself within the Milky Way, Cox continued. He concluded by saying, Sadly, as of today, I still feel that pressure. So can we perhaps focus on not messing our world up rather than hoping that, to paraphrase Sagan, someone will float down to save us from ourselves? Sue Gauff, a spokesperson for the Pentagon, and others insist that Grush's claims are untrue. Others, however, contend that the topic merits scrutiny given the overwhelming volume of UAP reports, whistleblowers, and anecdotes. Despite years of research, scientists have not yet found any evidence of life in the universe. Still, it is very unlikely that Earth is the only home to intelligent life, L given the vast number of planets and moons in the universe. The question of whether we will discover evidence in our lifetime is still open.
Thanks for watching another episode of Voyager. While you're still here, make sure to click the video on your screen for more mind-blowing videos about space.